be recorded. Okay, record is on. So last time we talked about um, basically we were already at the end of the G function discussion. We talked about the inverse function. Um, your you have homework assignment. So I'm just I'm just going to go through some of the announcements that I have sent since the end of the last lecture, just so that people are you know, aware of all of these things. We have two homework assignments due on the Wednesday, you know, this Wednesday. Uh, there are two of them, and they're both linked from you know this particular announcement. So I would strongly advise people who do not know about the homework assignments to you know kind of click on this particular announcement and get to the homework assignments. All right, so that's the first one. Is the homework assignments due on the fourteenth, which is Valentine's Day. The second one is exam one, okay? We are going to go over the practice. I wouldn't say that it's a practice. This is the actual exam from last semester. It is already attached as a part of the announcement. On, um, I sent this one out on the 10th. Um, so you all have access to the, to the exam that I'll be talking about on Wednesday. My advice is try to answer those questions by yourselves first, okay? And then on Wednesday, I will go over the answer to this particular exam. And if you have already done your part, then you can ask questions, okay, to clarify um, about specific points of this particular exam. Uh, the scope is going to be the same for you guys. The scope is going to be uh, starting from the very beginning of the semester including up to and including aleph null, which is also including Cantor's pairing function, which I'm going to get to next. All right. Any questions about exam one that you want me to answer right now? Yeah, go ahead. Say again? Yes, this is on paper. Um, I have not decided yet you know, whether to give you enough room you know, after each question or have you guys to have you know, additional pieces of paper to write your answers. So I haven't really quite decided on that part yet. It depends on what kind of question I want to ask. Uh, certain questions are better off if I give you enough space and the other kinds of questions you know, it's better off if you use your own pieces of paper. I haven't quite decided on that yet. Um, but what we already know, yeah, go ahead. Yes, it's going to be open book, open notes. Anything that is printed or handwritten prior to the test, you can bring it. If you want to bring an entire textbook, like you know someone who has been who had taken this class, you know, and at another college, you want to bring your know, textbooks to it with you. That's fine. If you want to print out all the modules and bring that with you, that's fine. If you want to. If you know friends who know friends who know friends who have, you know, and you have a complete collection of all the exams that I have ever done in this particular class and all the keys, bring that with you if you think it's going to help. Is that okay? All right. <clears throat> so the only thing I do not allow that is somewhat related to what we are talking about is for people to write something on a piece of paper and then pass it to the next person during the test. That, was, that is not okay. Even though it's on paper, it is not okay. So do not communicate with each other or anyone else during the exam. So the exam reflects your understanding of the material, not that of somebody else. And okay, any other questions related to the exam? Questions? All right. So I am going to close this one. Once again, you'll click on these announcements and click on the links included in the announcements too, because you know they can be helpful. Uh, this one can be helpful because you know since exam one is on the horizon, for people who want to study, this is potentially ways to help you. I'm not saying that this is going to help you, but potentially you can use utilize AI to help you because the material that we are talking about in this class are pretty well established. In other words, we are not talking about something that did not exist in year 2020. This has been around for a long time. So you can ask chat GPT questions like this. What does blah, blah, blah mean? Okay. 
Now that blah, 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 okay, is basically this particular expression here. So ChatGPT explains the entire thing in its own way. It says, you know, the expression for all x in A, p of x, p, p of x, is a mathematical notation used in formal logic and set theory. It represents a universal quantification over the elements of the set, blah, 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 blah. And on top of that, it explains every symbol in the expression. If you find my notes a little terse and difficult to understand, this is actually a really, really good resource to ask, to find, you know, to get extra clarification or even examples or even exercise. You can actually formulate and ask chat GBT, give me something to work on. And then later on, after you figure out the answer, you can ask in the same conversation, what are the solutions to those problems? Then you can compare. So a resource. Um, let me get back to the other announcement. There's one more before we move on to the actual topic that we'll talk about today. <clears throat> it is about the G function that we have been talking about, and we are done with it already because last week we actually finished the entire thing. I talked about the inverse function. So this is another link here you can go to, <clears throat> and it shows you a very short conversation that I have with chat and GPT, and I ask what is a biject bijection F such that F maps from um, the Cartesian product between natural numbers to the set of natural numbers. That's what I asked. And the answer was basically, you know, the G function that we have been talking about in this class. Um, and it has full explanations for that. I also asked, can you show me how to derive the inverse to the Cantor pairing function, which is the name of our quote unquote G function. And it showed all the steps as well. Okay, the reasoning, the steps. It's not quite as complete this time compared to my notes. Um, but nonetheless, you know, it showed that you know, it solved the whole thing as a quadratic equation and what it used you know, as the constants and so on. So in a very pragmatic sense, this is a very good resource to use for this class. Unfortunately, this resource is not as useful for my CISP 310 class, especially you know, once we start to get into my own processor. But for this class, just about all of the topic that we talk about in this class are well documented by the year 2022, which means chat GPT has plenty of material to train on. And so it has reliable you know, responses for the material for this class. So before you use chat GPT, you have to ask that question. You know, does chat GPT have sufficient exposure to a certain subject matter? This is like pretty standard stuff. All right, any questions? Any comments on how you can utilize your know, chat GPT to study. Has anyone tried to do that with your classes, including this one? Okay. Do you find it useful? Yeah, especially like especially like that the why prompt. Oh yeah, you're right. Uh, ah <laughs> That is very good. Okay, so that means you are not just you know, taking chat and GPT's responses like that. You're actually reading it through and see if that makes sense or not. Cool. All right, so that's all the announcements in, since last week, since the last time we met in this class. So what we are doing now is we are moving on to relations. Oh, by the way, you know, remember there are two homework assignments. You know, one is space folding. And then the other one is the function assignment, okay? So don't forget your homework assignments are due on Wednesday before class. But we are starting a new topic today called relations. The module is written a while back. 2021 was the last time I touched it. But once again, it has not changed, okay? You know, all of this stuff here is, is pretty classic um, logic. So it doesn't change over time that much. The reason why we have to talk about relations is because we care about sorting. So why is sorting important in computer science? Say that one more time. 
right? It prioritizes it. It it orders the information in a way that hopefully the most relevant information is listed first, or something along that line.、Um, it depends on the context. If you are playing a video game,、uh, sorting is important because you you want to know who is the best player up to this point.、Um, if you're shopping, you know, like for gasoline, you want to find out you know、uh, what is the best deal for me. It's not just the cost of the fuel, but it also involves you know, how far is that gas station? Because you know, if you have to go really far, like twenty miles to a gas station, and it's only two cents you know, cheaper per gallon, and your gas tank is small, it's only ten gallon, it may not worth that trip to go to that gas station just to have, just to pay two cents less per gallon. So there are a lot of information you know that we have to evaluate. Okay, so the key is we have to evaluate and come up with, okay, what should I choose? Okay,、It、has to do with choices. So this entire topic relates to relations, because the operators that we typically use you know, for comparison, they are called relational operators. Less than, less than or equal to, equal to, greater than, greater than or equal to. Those are all relational operators. It relates integers with each other. It relates real numbers with each other, so that we know the ordering, or whether they are the same or not. In the case of natural numbers, yes, go ahead. Relations would not be in exam one, so we are done with all the topics in terms of exam one. On Wednesday, we'll talk about the answers to the homework assignment. As well as the exam that I gave you, the sample, so that would conclude everything that you need to know about exam one.、Mm -hmm, sure. All right. So the bottom line here, I know I'm not reading this in order, but the bottom line is we want to know whether a relation is totally ordering or not, because we can only sort when the values in a set. Are totally ordered. That is what we are trying to shoot for. Is can we sort blah blah blah, and those blah 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 must be related in a total order. But to explain what is total order, we have to go through a lot of other stuff. You know, like you know, we'll get to all that stuff. <clears throat> so that's the purpose of this particular module is to kind of talk about relational operators and how to evaluate. Uh, relational operators, so that we can determine: Can we sort using this particular operator? That is the the question that we want to answer with all of the stuff that we talk about in this particular module. The first topic is: What exactly is a relation? As it turns out, it's really simple, and it is confusing in a way because it seems like it has something to do with functions when it does not. So what we'll do is: I'm just going to read this. A little bit slower, okay. Gradually, a relation is technically whether two elements of a set are related or not. So you might ask, related in what way? It doesn't specify. All it asks is, are they related? Okay. So if there are different ways for two elements in a set to be related, then you need multiple relations to express that. But we focus on one relation at a time in this class. So we'll consider a relation R that is defined over a set X. Okay, so in this case, this is a this is the very specific language to describe R and X. X is providing the elements. R is describing how the elements relate to each other. Is that okay? All right. So the first point is really really simple. R is a subset of the Cartesian product between X and X. So right here, <clears throat> we look at this and we go like, isn't that one of the things that a function also needs? The answer is yes and sort of no, because in the case of a function, you can have a domain and a codomain and they don't need to be the same. But in the case of a relation, we are defining a relation over a particular set. So this particular Cartesian product must have x and x. You know, on both sides of the Cartesian product. Unlike in the case of a function, where it is a Cartesian product between the domain and the codomain, but the domain and the codomain do not need to be the same. They can be the same, but they don't have to be. 
And that's it. There are no additional requirements in order for R to be a relation. It just has to be a subset of the Cartesian product of the set where the elements are coming from. So what about that thing about one thing can only map to one other thing, one and only one other thing? Nope, no, no such requirement. What about uniqueness? Nope, no such requirements. What about using all of the other stuff? Nope, no such requirements. So all the things that we have talked about, about uh, injection and surjection and all that stuff, they do not apply in any way in this particular module. And instead, we have a whole new set of stuff that is applicable. So <laughs> it, it's not, in a way it's easier, in a way it's harder. So when we get to it, you guys can tell me whether it, it is harder or easier. This means that every element in a relation is a two-tuple in a set where both items of the two-tuple come from the same set where the relation is defined over. In other words, you know, what elements are we describing? Okay, the relations of what elements are we describing? The set of those particular elements is X in this case. From the notation perspective, it is conventional to write X relates to Y via R as X R Y. So R can be less than or equal to, you know, in mathematics, can be greater than or equal to. But in this class, R is, can be very, very arbitrary, okay? So we'll use very arbitrary relationship, you know, relations in this class as examples. This is the infix notation of a relation. Note that R, X, R, Y is not an assertion. It is a question of asking, does X relate to Y? And that relation does not have to be symmetric either, which means R, X, Y can be different from Y, R, X. Think of R as less than or equal to. X is less than or equal to Y does not mean that Y is less than or equal to X, okay? <clears throat> so do we have any questions about section two, which is kind of like just describing the, um, the requirements of a relation and how we use the term of X, R, Y? Any questions? I'm going to throw one thing in, you know, just, you know, from the perspective of notation. I think this is important to know. And let me maximize the screen like so. All right, so this is important, I think, especially for people who like to look at things from a, me uh, from a very mechanical perspective. So I'm going to write this here. Um, X, R, Y is really saying the same thing as X, Y as a two-tuple is in R. Do we have any questions about this particular statement? This statement has to be true because it defines the notation. Any questions? All right. So assuming that we don't have any questions, I'm going to move on. <clears throat> so moving on to a concrete example. The familiar for comparison operator, which is less than in this case, is a relation. It can be defined over any set that is fully ordered, but for now we only consider the set of integers, otherwise known as Z, the funny looking Z. As an example to illustrate that the relation is a set, we'll consider the following statement. A is less than two is true. I don't think anyone in this class is going to object to that, but our focus is not the fact that one is less than two, but the, but the notation that we are using less than as a relation, it is between the two elements that we want to evaluate whether you know, one is less than the other one or not. And I can just the same, you know, use the, sec the other notation, which is the tuple one two is an element of a set. Now that the name of this particular set is funny. Right? When was the last time you defined the name of a set as the less than? Well, there's no restriction either. This is, not a, this is not a programming class. There's no restriction of what you can use, what symbols you can use as the name of a set. So in the second bullet point, I am looking at less than as a set of two tuples where the, the set is a Cartesian product of integers crossing with integers. So it, this is strictly seen from a perspective of notation. 
not whether one really is less than two or not. Are we still doing okay so far with the notes here with my module? Yes. Uh, can you ask the question again? Sorry. Yeah, I, I may have misunderstood, but um, you had said that the less than sign is mm -hmm. basically not saying that one is less than two, right? Or is it that it is closer to one? So if we want to look at other elements of this particular set, let's take a look at you know the other elements in the same set and you know, things that are not in that set. So in this case, we can say, Three two is an element of less than is false because the set does not contain three two because the way we understand less than three is not less than two three does not relate to two in a less than way okay that's the other way to put it but the typical way that we write this is three is less than two is false the infix notation is a lot more convenient where you know, the, the relation is between the two things that you are trying to quote unquote relate or you want to evaluate whether they relate or not. So these two notations are basically equivalent to each other. I just want to emphasize that we are looking at relation not only from the perspective of an operator, but from the perspective as a two tuple in a subset of the Cartesian product of the set that provides the elements. Okay. So that's a good question because you know, I just want to emphasize it's a, it's a notational thing, it's not so much a concept thing. All right, so now we look at some examples. So if we define X, you know, the set that's providing all the elements to consist of elements A, B, C, D, all lowercase, we can define an arbitrary relation R, okay? I have to emphasize that this particular R is arbitrary, okay? It does not have any special meaning. It's not less than, it's not greater than, it's not equal to, it's not not equal to. I just chose some random elements from the Cartesian product and throw them into R and say, yes, this is how I want to define R. Is this R useful at all? No, it's not supposed to, okay? It's not useful other than being an example, that's all. So in this specific case of how I define R over X, then we can say the following. A, R, B is true because A, B is indeed a two tuple in the set R. So if we look at R as a relation, then A, R, B is true. B, C is an as an element of R, it's also true because now uh, that one is pretty clear. BC is an element of R, okay? Not a problem. BRB is false because BB as a two tuple is not in R. And then DC is an element of R is also false because when you look at the five elements of R, DC as a two tuple is missing. So once again, this is just an example to once to illustrate the notation, okay? You know, we can use the notation of using the R in between the two things. We can also use the notation of looking at two tuples, whether they are elements in the set or not. All right, so now we move on to the last paragraph, which has some examples and some numbers, okay? So we wanna see whether that makes sense or not. As stated earlier, R is not the only relation that can be defined over X because X times X, the Cartesian product, in this case has 16 elements. All right, I just made a statement. I said the Cartesian product of X versus X itself has 16 elements. Do we know why? Okay, we are, are we comfortable with the, the assessment that the Cartesian product of X and itself has 16 elements? because A can be paired with any one of the A, B, C, D, B can be paired with any one of the A, B, C, D, so we have four times four, which is 16. All right, the number of relations that can be defined over X is two to the power of 16. Does that make sense to you? Does this relate to one of the questions in the first function homework assignment? 
All right. Okay. So we are trying to draw all those uh, connections of things that we have seen already, things that we have already thought about or talked about, to things that we are just introducing here. Think of the presence of each element of x times x as a bit, and so on and so forth. And that's why you have a 16-bit integer. But the number of integers, unique integer values that you can represent in the 16-bit integer is 2 to the power of 16, because each digit can be a 0 or a 1, and they're all independent from each other. So you, are, you have 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, and then you have to do it 16 times. And as a result, you have 2 to the power of 16 possible relations they can define over x in this case. All right. Do we have any questions in section four before we start to talk about properties of relations? No? Okay, all right. So let's go ahead and start with section five. Now, when we get to section five, we're going to do a bunch of examples. The first one is reflexive. Okay, we say that a relation R over a set X, set X is reflexive if and only if the following statement is true. All right, so now we're going to look at this and go like, what does that mean? Hmm. So first question first, what does it mean? Second question is what if you don't like the way I explain it? So if you don't like the way that I explain it, use chat GPT. The question is how do you use, how do you use chat GPT to explain this? The answer is you go to chat you know, GPT, have a lot of conversations going, and then the next thing you do is go back here, right click on the expression that you want to ask something about, go to show math as, or just copy to clipboard with tech commands. And then you switch to chat GPT, and then you just ask it a question. Explain what, okay? And if you want to use the LaTeX notation, use backslash open parent and backslash close parent to enclose the entire thing. So I typically just do the open and the close at the same time, and then back to the, um, the inside of the parentheses. So this way I don't forget to close it later on. Okay, if this is something that I do, you don't have to do the same thing. Just pasting that thing means in, and you can even give it more um, context in relations. There we go. Hit the enter key. And it breaks it down. And it also, look at the last paragraph. This property is often called the reflexive property of a relation. In other words, I'm trying to work myself out of the job here. You don't need me anymore. I just need to give you a bunch of words, and you guys can learn it by yourself. <laughs> but this is a great tool. What I really want to do is to show you how great a tool this is, because being able to learn things on your own, by yourself, is super important when you are hired, okay? When you want to get a job, your people want to know, can you learn this on your own or do you need someone to handhold you through the entire process? Knowing how to use tools like this will, will give you an edge, okay? Because you can learn it faster, you know, than just reading a book, which is completely passive. Are we good so far with this example? Okay, so I'm just integrating the use of your know, chat and GPT and also how to prompt chat GPT because you know, that's one of the um, hottest jobs, I guess, in 2024. You know, they anticipate you know, uh, prompt engineers, you know, which is, you know, I don't think it's, those are engineers because engineering is very involved, okay? But prompt engineering, as they say, if you refer to that term, is one of the hot jobs in 2024. Just knowing how to ask chat GPT questions in a way to get the answer that you want. All right, so I think this is kind of cool. <clears throat> but getting back to my own explanation, okay? Okay, so now what we want to do is to look at this and go like, okay, can we go through some examples where some of these are reflexive and others are not reflexive? Okay, so we can certainly do that. I'm gonna use the chat GPT way of answering a question every single 
answer starts with certainly. I'm glad to, or something like that. I'm typically not as courteous as ChatGPT. <clears throat> I think ChatGPT will pass the Turing test before I do. And I'm okay with that too. <laughs> all right, so let's take a look at a few examples. Of all of these examples, I'm going to use the same X. Okay? So X has, we'll just use AB, okay, just you know, so that it doesn't get too lengthy. The first one I'm going to throw at you, you know, which is R, uh, is the empty set. So right off the bat, I give you a tricky example. Or, you know, I don't think it should be tricky by now, but I'm just going to throw this one out. The question is, is R reflexive when it is empty? Let's check all the requirements. The first one is, is it a subset of the Cartesian product of X versus itself? Yes, because a empty set is a subset of every set, okay, including itself. Okay, so it, it has met the requirement. The second one is, um, if we look at every element in X, do we find the element and itself in a two-tuple in R? The answer is, the answer is no, okay? So in other words, in this very specific case, reflexive, okay, I'm going to write it down. Reflexive means <clears throat> AA in R conjunction with BB in R. In other words, it is reflexive if and only if AA is in R and BB is also in R. But since R is an empty set, no, they're both false. So in this case, it is not reflexive. It's the empty set is not reflexive. All right, so once we know this, then you can evaluate this and probably come to a conclusion by yourself, okay? Is this reflexive? Of the two things that I need, one is here, but not both. So is this new R reflexive? Nope, it is not, because you know, we want this evaluation, this entire conjunction to be true. So we have one side of the conjunction being true, but the other side of the conjunction continues to be false, so that means the entire conjunction is false. So this is also not reflexive. Okay, reflexive, there we go. All right, so let's take a look at the third one, which consists of AA and BB. Aha, this one is reflexive, okay? Is reflexive. I'm gonna throw another one out to you. What if we have AA? A, B, and B, B. Is that reflexive? So look at the conjunction, okay? Focus on the conjunction. Is the conjunction true for the last example of R? It is, okay. So it is still reflexive, even though we got some extra stuff. The extra stuff is okay, okay? We only care about whether AA and BB are both in R. If it has some extra stuff, it's okay, not a problem. Because the conjunction is focusing on just AA and BB. It doesn't care about any other elements in relation, in the relation. So this is still reflexive. Oops, I cannot spell, there we go, okay. Do we have any questions about these examples of whether a relation is reflexive or not? We good? Okay, looks like we're good. All right. <clears throat> so we are gonna move on to the next property, which is symmetry. So let me use a mouse pointer to point to where we are. Sym symmetric. A relation R over a set X is symmetric if and only if the following is true. Another quantified you know, statement. This is why I you know, focus on quantification so much earlier in the class because we are using the mathematics, 
you were using the mathematical notation to express properties in this case in a very concise and yet precise way. Once again, if you copy and paste this equation and ask your chat GPT to explain it, it probably will identify this as symmetry. I haven't tried that, okay? You guys can try that on your own, but I think it will find it. Okay, so what does it mean though? Well, for every way to find E, F in X, okay? So that means you know, you know, E can be, in, this, in the previous example, can be A or B, and so can F. Can E, F both be A? Yes. Can they both be B? Yes, okay? Because this notation does not say anything about E and F being different. It simply says E has to be an element of X, F also has to be an element of X. It's a shorthand for two, for all, you know, one for E and one for F. You know, this is just a shorthand for that. But what is inside the parentheses? What am I trying to quantify, okay? What I'm trying to quantify is E, F is an element of R if and only if F, E is an element of R. The key is this operator here, if and only if. So now you have to remember, how do I make the operator if and only if true? Does anyone remember how do you make if and only if true? So if and only if is the same thing as if, um, okay, let me just write it here. It's easier for me to write it and to say it. A if and only if B is exactly the same thing as A implies B and B implies A. It means exactly the same thing. So now you just have to remember what is implication. So as it turns out, A implies A if and, if and only if B is true when A and B are the same. False if and only if false is true. True if and only if true is also true. And that's it. Okay, so that's the first thing you need to remember when you are reading the notes. When you see symbols like this, you have to know what it means. Okay, all right, so what does it mean? It means if one side is true, the other side has to be true. If one side is false, the other side has to be false too. Okay, does everybody understand what I just said? If one side is true, the other side also has to be true. If one side is false, then the other side also has to be false. It does not matter whether you're reading from left to right or right to left, okay? All right, so keep that in mind, and we are gonna go through some examples again. So we'll go through uh, the typical example. I'm gonna rewrite your X, which is still just your know, AB as elements. So this AB has nothing to do with the earlier AB, which are, so, okay, scope separator. Okay, the, the use of AB has nothing you know, to do with each other across this line. All right, so this is X, and I'm defining R as an empty set first. So once again, I'm throwing a wrench into this entire thing right off the bat. Is this R, which is the empty set, is it symmetric? Does it meet the requirement that if one side is false, the other side has to be false as well. If one side is true, the other side also has to be true. Does it meet that requirement? So how do you process that? Okay, I know this looks kind of abstract. How do you process it? Now you have all taken CISP 360 or a class equivalent to 360 as well as 400. So you know control structures already. So what you want to do is to convert this into that control structure mindset and ask yourselves, if I were to write a program, a piece of code, to evaluate you know, that, you know, okay, let me point out what I'm talking about, to evaluate this thing here, how would you write it? Okay, so think about that. And what iterations are you gonna go through? So we are looking at every single possible way to pair up you know, A, A with E, um, something with E and something with F in the original you know, document. So how many possible ways can we pair that up? So I'm looking at variable E, E, variable F. 
and E and F you know, correspond to <coughs> EF over here. And we are talking about X that only has two elements. You know, one is A, one is B, right? Okay. So let's switch back to the tablet here. So can someone tell me what values can be in E as a variable? A or B, okay, All right? So E can be A or B. And when E has a value of A, what can F have? A or B, because they are independent variables. So now we have only four possible ways of evaluating this entire thing. So now you have to ask yourself, um, what about E, uh, F is in R, if and only if F, E is in R. So now you just have to evaluate that expression. Yes, I kind of messed up here. This is not meant to be a semicolon. There we go. Uh, e, okay, I cut out a little bit too. A little bit too much, E, F, there we go, okay. So now for each row, you tell me, okay? A, A in R, if and only if A, A is in R, R is empty. What happens to the value of that expression? Okay, so what do you do? You break it down and you just evaluate each side of the if and only if. Once you have both sides, then you evaluate the if and only if. All right, so let's do this. Uh, a, A is in R. Is that true or not? It's false. What about A, A is in R? That is also false. What is false if and only if false? True, that's right. Okay, so this is true. Um, on the second row, A is, E is A, F is B. Rem remember, E, F are variables. A and B are elements in the set X. So let me ask you this question. A, B as a two tuple is in R. Is that true or not? No, because it's an empty set. What about the other way around? What about B, A as a two tuple in R? It is also false. False, false if and only if false is true. So because I make R an empty set, that makes it very easy to answer all the questions because nothing is an element of R. Does that make sense? So that means here, every single right on every row, the left-hand side of the if and only if, as well as the right-hand side of the if and only if, are guaranteed false, which means every single one of these rows ends up with false if and only if false, which is true, okay? Now, now that we have worked out this table, what is the actual value of this entire thing? Because you know, remember, we are using a quantified expression here. So what about the entire quantified expression? Is it true or false? True, right? Because we are basically you know, using a conjunction of all of these things. So the entire conjunction thing is true. We are using conjunction to connect every single row because we have a for all universal quantifier because it has to be true for every single possible way of blah, blah, blah. And in this case, yep, it is true for every single possible case. All right. Do we have any questions? No questions. All right. So I am expecting people to read a little bit ahead of the class, but even if people are not reading ahead of the class, I'm still kind of expecting people to understand this material in the lecture, okay? Because it only references things that we have already talked about and certain things we have talked about multiple times already as well. So, you know, that's kind of my expectation. So if you're having some doubt about you know whether you are understanding this material or not you know you can come to my office hour and we can work it out okay so that's one example let's look at the other example let's look at uh, this one here okay is this symmetric you basically work out the same table here and you end up with one 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 as again 
right? Okay, so this is also symmetric. So I'm going to say this is symmetric. This is also symmetric. What about this? Is that symmetric or not? And you have to remember, you have to be able to answer why it is or, and why it is not symmetric. So is it symmetric or not? It is not symmetric, very good. And why is it not symmetric? Exactly, okay, very good. So that means you know, if I were to use, uh, use the table approach and redo the entire table, I would end up with something with at least one of the rows returning a false. So let's do that. <clears throat> and I'm gonna use the lasso tool so I can copy and paste. And we want to duplicate here. And then after that, we can redo every single row. So we'll go back here and just get rid of the answers already figured out from last time. Okay. So in this case, AA is in R, if and only if AA is in R, which is represented by the first row. Is that true or not? It is true. The if and only if is true. The element of is false. Okay, does everybody understand what I just said? If I look at each side, this is false, okay? Because AA is not in R. This side is also false because AA is not in R. But when you have false on this side, false on this side, then the if and only if operator returns true, okay? So we don't have a problem with this row. What about A, B? So let's say E has A, F has B. A, B is in R is true. B, A is in R is false. So what is true if and only if false? It is false, very good. So that's how we can put a zero here and a zero here and a one here. So how do we combine all the zeros and ones? They're all are they ORed together or are they ENDED together? They're conjunction, right? They're ENDED together. So if you combine all of these, I'm just going to be super lazy here, then this conjunction is going to be false because at least one row returns a value of false, so the entire thing is going to be false. So that means in this case, it is not symmetric. Symmetric. There we go. All right, so I think the next example is pretty easy now that we have shown that example. Okay, that's that's my bad. You know, I double wrote the B. Oh, no, it shows okay here, but it just messed up in my screen, on my screen. What about this one? It is symmetric, very good. All right, very good. So I think I'm, we are done with symmetry. So let's move on to the next property, which is transitive. So we'll look at this you know, definition again. Okay, so a relation R over a set X is transitive if and only if the following is true for all E, F, G in X. In other words, now we have a triple loop. Okay, one loop to find values for E, one loop to find a value for F and one loop to find a value of G. So for every way to find values for E, F, and G, this thing has to be true. What is that saying? I have a lot more parentheses than I really need because of uh, operator priority, but that's okay. It just makes things a little bit more clear. This basically says if E, F is in R and F, G is also in R, that conjunction should imply that E, G is also in R. Do we have any questions about what that statement means? Okay. So remember, implication is an operator. It returns a value that is either true or false. Okay. 
So I'll be doing okay so far with the transitive property. Okay, so if you have your own laptop computer or whatnot, you can stay on this definition. But I'm switching over back to the tablet to give you some examples. All right, so once again, we have X being just AB. Now this one with AB is actually not a whole lot of fun. I mean, you can do a lot more when there are at least three elements. But we are okay with just two for now. So once again, I give you an empty relation. The question is, is the empty relation transitive? Uh -huh. Okay, I see some people nodding. What about the rest of the class? What do you think? Okay, I see both, a whole bunch of people nodding. So let's find out why that is the case. If you want to work this out using a truth table, it's going to be a little bit long, okay, because we got three independent variables, and even though each um, variable can only have two values, we still end up with eight rows. So I'm not going to do the truth table approach in this case. But in your mind, you can still think of it as a triple loop, where E is one loop, F is one loop, G is one loop, and they're all nested. Okay, so by the time you get to the innermost loop, E, F, G all have values, and you're evaluating a particular expression, which is this expression starting from here, ending over here. So when R is empty, it means every single element of is going to be false starting with, say, the first one here. So this is guaranteed to be false because R is empty in our example. So that means what? Well, it means the conjunction is guaranteed to be false. If the conjunction is guaranteed false, then the implication is guaranteed true. Done. Do you see how I don't even have to evaluate the right-hand side of the conjunction or the right-hand side of the implication? It's all because of the truth table. It all has to do with if one side of conjunction is false, it guarantees the entire conjunction is, is false. But if the left-hand side of an implication is true, it guarantees the implication itself has to be true. Did I say it wrong? Did I say it wrong? Let me repeat that because I could have said it wrong. If the left-hand side of an implication is false, it guarantees the implication itself is true. So by only looking at this, and knowing that R is empty, I can now conclude, yep, it is transitive, done. Is that okay? All right, okay. So let's try some other examples for transitive. So let's try eh, the next trivial example here. Is that transitive? It is transitive, okay? So this is definitely transitive. All right, so we'll say is transitive, is transitive. Oops, there we go. Let's take a look at uh, this one here. Is that transitive, okay? And then we look at something that's a little bit odder. What about this? Is that transitive? Okay, so if you think this is not transitive, then in your mind, you have to come up with a counterexample. What does that mean, come up, coming up with a counterexample? It means you have to find me a way to assign values to E, F, and G such that that whole expression thing is false, okay? So let's let's see what, what that means, okay? Because I need to switch back to this, to the original definition. So if you think this entire thing is false, that means you can find a way to give E, F, and G specific values so that this expression is false, okay? Because if, if you cannot find a counterexample, then by default, everything is true. So now you have to ask, can I find that counterexample? How do I go about finding that counterexample? Well, you want an implication to be false. There's only one way to, find, to make an implication false. 
it is making the uh, left hand side true but the right hand side false okay so now you have to look at the left hand side and say okay how do i make this conjunction true okay i have to find two tuples so that you know you, we have ef and then fg well you can have ef fg all being a's okay that's not a problem but in that case aa is in r is also true okay so that doesn't make it false the only other way is to say what if uh, i make ef um, aa and then fg a, B. In other words, E is A, F is A, G is B. Okay? That makes the conjunction true because those two elements are in fact in R. But over here, E is A, G is F. Right? Uh, G is B, sorry. G is B. So A, B is in R. It's also true. You, you cannot make one side true and then the other side false. You cannot make the left-hand side true but the left-hand side false. So if you cannot find that counterexample, then the answer is it is transitive. All right. So switching back to the tablet, we'll say this is also transitive. Okay. And we look at the next one, which is A, B, and B, A. What about this one? So once again, okay, you, if you want to think, okay, I suspect this is false, then you have to figure out a way in order to make that implication itself false. And in this case, turns out it's pretty easy, okay? <clears throat> because I can make E A, I can make F B, I can make G A again. So in that case, A B is in R, not a problem, it is true. BA is in R, also true, not a problem. So the conjunction is true. But in this particular case, E and G are all A's, right? So that means on the right-hand side of the implication, I end up with AA is in R, which in this case is false. So I have just found a counterexample. Now, is there another counterexample? Yes, but all I need is just one to show that the universally quantified statement is false. Is that okay? So I'm just going to write down here, this is not transitive. Because AA is missing, BB is also missing in this case. Are we good so far? All right. All right, so let's go to the next one. Okay, The next one is called anti-symmetric, which is not the same as not symmetric. Because you know, when people look at this from a linguistic perspective, they go like, isn't that the same thing? Because anti means kind of counter, not. So that means you know, anti-symmetric just means you know, not symmetric. No, okay? That is not what it means. So we want to evaluate this one carefully because this one can be a little bit tricky. A relation R over a set X is anti-symmetric if and only if the following is true. So this time we have only two variables, just E and F. And it looks a little bit like transitive, but it's not transitive. Because in this case, it says EF is in R and FE is in R implies E and F are the same. Okay, so this one is tricky. So we'll go ahead and take a look at a few examples again. <clears throat> uh, there we go. And we'll take a look at an MTR again. Okay. I'm not going to repeat X here you know, because we're going to use exactly the same X as in the previous examples. So we want to make R empty and see if an empty relation is anti-symmetric or not. So just remember R is empty. Okay, that's easy to remember. So I'm going to switch back to the actual expression. So the question is, can I make this implication false? Well, to make that implication false means I have to find something that makes the left-hand side true and then the left, the right-hand side false of the implication. <coughs> I think that's going to be a huge challenge for us because what is on the left-hand side of the implication? It's a conjunction. 
but what is inside each component of the conjunction? Element of. And what set are we dealing with? The empty set. There's nothing in an empty set, so all the element of is false. To be more specific, I only have to look at the first one. Guaranteed false, right? Which means the conjunction is guaranteed false, which also guarantees the implication is true. So that means it is anti-symmetric because I, it would be impossible for me to make the implication false. All right, so that means you know, this is anti-symmetric. The empty set is very interesting, okay? You know, because you know, it, it really presents, it's easy to process in a way, but it's also difficult to process in some other way. Okay, so we have AA and AB. What about this one? Do you think this one is anti-symmetric or not? It is anti-symmetric. Okay, this one is indeed anti-symmetric. Is anti-symmetric. Okay, let's try something else. Let's try uh, AABB. Oh, I said AABB. I wrote something else. Okay, AABB. Is that anti-symmetric or not? Yeah, it is is anti symmetric. There we go. What about this? A B B A. Is that anti symmetric? <clears throat> it is not anti symmetric. Okay, very good. Because this one is actually pretty obvious. You know, this is the advantage of using a, an example that has very few elements. So if I switch back here, I can make E A, I can make F B. A B is in R, it's true. B A is in R, true. A equals B, not true. So we are done. All right. So I'm going to go back to here because I do want it to be recorded. It's not anti-symmetric. All right. So I'm going to take row here, you know, because you know, this is a little bit of you know, processing. You know, I'm just using the row taking activity like a short break. And today is the 12th. I will show you the access code. It's reflexive. So it is reflexive, R-E-F-L-E-X-I-V-E. -E. I'm going to write it on the whiteboard. All right. All right, I'm going to go back to my notes. Then you guys are participating in road taking. All right, does anyone need more time for road taking? Or are we all good? Looks like we are good. Okay. All right, so we're going to introduce you know, what is partial ordering. Partial ordering, you know, in, the de in this particular definition, it is said that a set X is to be, X is partially ordered by a relation R if and only if the following is true. R is reflexive, R is anti-symmetric, and R is also transitive. If all three are true, then we say that R as a relation over X is partial ordering. All right? 
So partial ordering is interesting because um, the relational operator less than is not partial ordering. It is not partial ordering because, first of all, it is not reflexive. A value is not less than itself. So you know, that's, that's kind of the tricky part of, of partial ordering. So I want to talk about you know, why partial ordering is not um, sufficient. Okay? It's, it's, it's good to have in some cases. It's all you need. But if you want to be able to sort elements in a particular set, it cannot be just partial ordering. It has to be totally ordered. It cannot be partially ordered. So the reason why that is the case, it has to do with there are certain things that may not be relating to each other at all. So you cannot decide, is this going to be ahead of this one if I want to list these two items? So partial ordering is not sufficient, but it is important, an important step to lead to total ordering. So in this case, I use a beer commercial. Okay, for those of you who want to actually look up the commercial, you can look up uh, YouTube, and it's a beer commercial. It has to do with um, smooth but not rich, <clears throat> and they have several. Okay, they are all you know, pretty funny. So I'm gonna look up. I'll, I'll pick this one because you know I like cars, and this one does relate to cars. So I'm going to click on this one, and the speaker is on. OK, but where's my volume control? Right here. OK, skip. There we go. I'm pretty sure by today's standard, this is not a very politically correct you know, uh, commercial, but it is funny, okay? And I think the beer is, what, Australian? So it's okay. We'll give them a pass. But anyway, the concept is smooth versus rich. And I think the commercial has an implication that it is good to be both, okay? So everybody can agree that smooth and rich is good. Okay, it's the best. So what I'm doing here is I am going to make a little diagram here. Okay, so the first one is you know, rich and smooth. Okay, both. Okay, next one is rich but not smooth. The other one is smooth but not rich. And the last one is me, which is not smooth and not rich. All right. So now we want to say, um, instead of saying which one is better, we'll say which one is not worse than which one, okay? So, or at least as, quote unquote, attractive as, okay? So we'll say as least as attractive as. So we'll go ahead and say that um, R, okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll call this relation, okay, since we have used R and S already, we'll say T, okay? So T means at least as attractive as, and it will in parentheses, you know, in parentheses as defined in a beer commercial. Okay, because I don't want any trouble of people saying, so you're saying that I'm not attractive. No, 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 this is all based on the definition. Using the definition in a beer commercial, this is how we define T, okay? All right, so now we can say rich and smooth at the same time is at least as attractive as just being rich. Okay, do we have any problem with this? No, okay. Uh, we can also say rich and smooth is at least as attractive as itself, okay? Rich and smooth. All right? We'll also say rich and smooth is at least as attractive as just smooth but not rich.
And last but not least, we will say rich and smooth is at least as attractive as not rich and not smooth. Okay, so are we doing okay so far with this? All right, so we'll put this in one category. Now we look at just rich. So we'll say rich is at least as as least no, rich is at least as 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 attractive as just rich. Okay, it is reflexive, and then we'll say rich is at least as attractive as not rich, and not rich and and not smooth. But that's about all we can say. So we'll put this as a second box. Then we'll say smooth is at least as attractive as smooth. Smooth is at least as attract as at least as attractive as. Whew, that's a mouthful. Not rich and not smooth. Okay. And then last we'll say uh, not rich and not smooth is at least as attractive as not rich and not smooth. All right, so are we doing okay so far with the relation T that we're defining here? So let's check whether it is reflexive or not. I think it's reflexive because of the four values in the set, it relates to itself, okay? R and S relates to itself, R relates to itself, S relates to itself, not R and not S relates to itself. So it is reflexive, it has met the first requirement. The second requirement is it is transitive, okay? So we are, we are looking for chains in this case. So we are looking for chains like this, R and S, T, R, okay? And then R itself, T, not R, and not S. So if it is transitive, then we will find not uh, R and S, T, not R, and not S, okay? This is a demonstration of what transitive looks like in, in, in a set that has more than two elements. Is that okay? Okay, so it is transitive. Is it anti-symmetric? Yep, it is anti-symmetric because you cannot find a case where you have A, T, B, and then B, T, A when, when A and T are not the same. So it is also anti-symmetric. It has met all the three requirements that we have just mentioned. It is um, partial ordered, partially ordered. So the problem with this is I have no way to compare rich but not smooth versus smooth but not rich. Those two do not relate to each other using T. And that's why it is partially ordered because I can find elements out of the four elements. I can find at least two elements where I cannot figure out which way they relate because they do not relate to each other at all. Is that okay? All right, so this is partially ordered. The problem with partially ordered is you can define a function that you intend as a comparison of some kind. I'll give you an example. So let's just say that you're running a, an online game, okay, and you want to name you know, the player of the week, and you come up with a really gigantic you know, scheme of evaluating. You can now say, okay, if somebody put in a lot of money to buy skins, okay, we want to in increase the ranking because we want to encourage people to spend cash to get something that is virtual that does not exist. <laughs> okay? You also want to encourage people to be courteous to each other. So you want to evaluate based on friendliness to the teammates. You also want to <laughs> evaluate based on skill set and so on. So now you have a function written in C, C++, Java, I don't care, okay? That takes in two structures, you know, each one representing a player, and it will try to try to relate you know, those two. It is entirely possible that you end up defining a function that is only doing partial order, which means there are cases where, oh, but how does this player relate to that player? And you don't know, but the function does not give you what you intend you know, to evaluate between those two. So if you have partial order in this case, then you cannot really name the player of the week because you, you can potentially end up with two players where they where there are the, there, there's no ordering between those two players. And as a result, you cannot say the player of the week is blah, blah, blah. Okay? 
So you can accidentally write comparison functions <clears throat> that are partially ordered, but not knowing that it is partially ordered, then you end up with you know um, you end up with a set of elements that cannot be sorted. Is that okay? I'm using this as an example. So if partially ordered is not you know, what we really want because it only does get certain things done but not everything, then how do we define something that is totally ordered? Well, as it turns out, you know, if you want, it, if you want something that is totally ordered, we just have to add one more property, which is called comparable. R is comparable over X if and only if for all EF in X, ERF, or FRE. That's all you need to do is to specify this additional property, then R is going to be totally ordered. All right, so do we have any questions about this entire relation module? I think I have a more kind of fundamental question. You know, you don't have to answer the question in the class. It has to do with, do you know how to read the notations? Do you know how to read the symbols? In other words, when you look at something like this or something like this, you know, what does it mean to you? So how well can you map the mathematical notation to what it means is what I'm asking not only because this is important in relations, but this is also important in your exam one, okay? Because I'm emphasizing on the ability to read notations throughout this entire class, because this is what you will need to deal with when you're dealing with higher level you know, computer science classes, which are basically fundamentally math classes. They're not programming classes anymore. So you don't have to answer the question, okay? If you're having difficulty reading this type of notation, you know, come to my office hour, okay? I might have your know, ideas to help you. Um, Chat GPT, once again, you know, is a great resource. You can give it something complex like this, okay? I'm gonna try that. So we'll give it transitive, which is one of the more complex ones. So we'll copy the tech commands. And once again, go to Chat GPT and ask, follow up with this particular you know, thread here. Um, can you describe this in the context of relations? Okay, there we go. So we'll, we'll see, okay? We'll see how well ChatGPT can answer a question like that. All right, so it says, you know, it breaks up the expression uh, for all is the universal quantifier. EFG are variables that take on values from the set X. EF in R denotes the order pair, blah, 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 is an element of, okay. And does it, yep, there we go. It knows what it means. Not only does it describe the expression, it actually is capable of relating that expression to the concept of R being transitive. So this to me tells me that you know, it's really quite capable. Um, in this particular case, I'm fairly sure you can trust your chat GPT for its answer because this type of material has been around for a long time. I mean, hundreds of years. And as a result, there are plenty of textbooks, there are plenty of tutorial and other types of you know, material online to train your know, chat GPT so the result from ChatGPT is, is somewhat reliable, okay? You're probably as reliable as another person. So once again, use this tool, okay? Especially if you're, you're, if you're finding the symbols difficult to understand and you cannot map the uh, symbolic expressions to the meaning of the expression itself, uh, this can help you. Now, the other thing you can also do, now this is, this is really cool, okay? Give me an example of a relation that is transitive and one that is not transitive. Okay, I haven't tried this. This is the first time. And it gives you 
this is transitive, less than is transitive, because if A is less than B and B is less than C, A is less than C. This one is not transitive. Um, so consider a set Y, A, B, and C, and define the relation as A, B is in S, B, C is in S, but A, C is not, then it is not transitive. So once, it, so it actually gave you an example, not in the notation that we want, okay, because I wanted the notation to be S equals to curly brace A, B, B, C, but A, C is not an element. So it's not exactly in the same notation that we have been using in today's lecture, but it's still using notations that we have already talked about, okay? So this is a good tool, okay? I think it is a reasonable tool to use despite, despite what your English writing professor has to say about chat and GPT. <laughs> um, so you go ahead and use it here you know, for studying purposes, but your actual exam is on paper and no electronics are, are you know, allowed during the exam. So don't count on this to help you in the exam, but in the process of learning, I think it is a reasonable tool to use. All right, I'll see you guys on Wednesday and we'll go over the test on Wednesday.